So in our last lesson, uh, we studied about the reconciliation between Jacob and Esau as Jacob returned home after being away for 20 long years with his father-in-law Laban. We remember that story, that's what we talked about last time. And we saw how he prepared to meet his brother Esau and the way that God strengthened his faith. We're talking about Jacob's faith, not Esau's faith. The Lord enabled him to see the angels who were protecting him and also appeared to him while Jacob struggled in prayer. It was the way that God was encouraging Jacob. Uh, and we mentioned last time that the reason Jacob was fearful is yes, he had gotten away from Laban. Yes, he was finally heading homeward, but there was this little issue of meeting Esau, his brother, that he had cheated out of, well, cheated or you know, manipulated out of his birthright. And the last time he heard Esau say anything, Esau said, the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. So you know, the, he wasn't expecting a very happy homecoming and was certainly fearful about that. And God strengthened him by enabling him to see who were his helpers uh, and also giving him encouragement. So the episode is one of Jacob's uh, developing faith. That's one of the stories about uh, Jacob. It's like another way, if you wanted to study this in a different way, uh, it would be to study how faith develops in a person. And Jacob's a wonderful example of that. You know, if you watch him, if you start with him young and then you move how he, you know, he moves to his father-in-law's place and, or future father-in-law's and how his faith develops over the years, then coming back to his own home and with his own children, a marvelous um, story of a progression of, uh, of faith. So in the end, we found that, of course, he meets with Esau. Both brothers are reconciled. And afterwards, Jacob goes on his way to settle in the land of Canaan, which had been promised to him before by God. So after these events, that's what we studied last time, after these events, there's a long period of silence because so far, you know, the Bible writers have been kind of writing about Jacob's life year per year. You know, he spent seven years doing this, he spent seven years doing that, he spent some more years doing, you know, uh, building up his, uh, his uh, wealth and, and family and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, after, after this episode, silence, nothing. For years and years, you don't hear, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't record anything that is going on. However, in uh, uh, chapter 34, the story picks up again uh, as Jacob's sons, now grown, you know, last time we left them, they were small, they were children. Now in verse 30, uh, chapter 34, now the kids are grown, they're grown men now. So the story picks up as the boys are um, grown men and as grown sons are wont to do, uh, they cause trouble uh, for their father and uh, their father finds himself on the run once again. So that's where we pick up the story. Uh, chapter 34 and let's begin reading here in uh, verses 1 to 4. It says, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, get me this young girl for a wife. So we see right away the problem of raising children in a pagan society, very evident here. Uh, Dinah, uh, the only daughter, seeks companionship. So who's she going to seek companionship with? Her brothers, these, you know, these boys, these guys. So what does she do? Well, she, has, you know, she seeks out the company of the other young women in the area where she lives, and they happen to be uh, uh, in a pagan religion. So of course, her brothers, you know, they have each other as companion, but she, lacking in friends, you know, she makes friends with unbelievers. Nothing new there. This happens thousands of years ago, but there's nothing new there. So her closeness to pagan friends gets her noticed and then ultimately gets her seduced and raped by the local chief's son. So you know, it says it kind of you know, obliquely here, but basically he just, you know, he raped her. Now, uh, I want you to note in the very short description that there's no remorse here. 
There's no rebuke, like the father of this Hamor, you know, he doesn't say to Shechem, what have you done, are you crazy? You know, that was disrespectful, or that was criminal, or that was, no, nothing. You know, it was like, yeah, so what? You know, no rebuke by the father, didn't see anything wrong with what his son did. So the young man is infatuated with Dinah, however, and he wants to marry her. And I, I'm only surmising here, but she must be different than the other girls. There's something about this girl that he really attractive to him. We know what it is. You know. You know, she's been raised in a godly family. That's the thing about her that's, that's different. So even in this culture, however, marriages were difficult to arrange. And so the young man's father begins to negotiate with Jacob and his family to propose a marriage between the two, because this was the time of arranged uh, marriages. So we keep reading the story beginning in verse 5 or continuing in verse 5. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter but his sons were with his livestock in the field so Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamor the father of Shechem went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it and the men were grieved and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing ought not uh, to be done. Uh, but Hamor spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us, give us uh, your daughters uh, to us and take our daughters uh, for yourselves. Thus you shall uh, live with us and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, if I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and, and gift and I will give according, to, uh, according as you say to me, but give me the girl in marriage. But Jacob's son answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah their sister. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. If you will become like us and that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters for ourselves and we will live with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Now their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So Jacob learns the news and he's distressed. And soon after the young man's father arrives to propose not only a marriage, but a complete amalgamation of both peoples. It's not just give us this one person, but let's kind of, you know, let's intermarry, let's, let's you know, amalgamate your, your family, your tribe, our tribe. And of course it would be one way of assimilating Jacob's family and wealth without war. <laughs> no war, no competition, we just, you know, we marry into them, you know. Of course, the danger here is the destruction of the nation by diluting their family and more importantly, their faith by intermarrying with pagans, the one thing God said not to do. So the first step had already begun with Dinah being taken by force. Now the brothers proposed that if the men of the town be circumcised, they would consent to intermarry, since this would satisfy their religious conditions. This is what they say to Shechem and Hamor and their family and their, their tribe. Of course, this was a plot for revenge, as we will see. So let's keep reading. Um, uh, oh yeah, I won't read 1824 too long. I'll just summarize it for you, okay? So upon hearing this, Hamor, the dad, and Shechem, the son, readily agree. They returned and they convinced the men of the town to be circumcised with the argument that it would be an economic advantage to intermarry with the Israelites. Okay, so here's a couple of points to note here about this story so far. First of all, Jacob is not present when this plan is hatched and proposed. He may have known later, but he didn't approve. Secondly, Reuben and Judah, the older brothers, were also not part of the plan and demonstrated in Genesis 37 with Joseph that they did not have a lot of stomach for bloodshed. So a couple of brothers hatched this plan. 
Thirdly, the two main protagonists were Simeon and Levi, who we will see, they're the ones that do the killing. And we find out Levi later on, the tribe of Levi, you know, very, very uh, audacious when it comes. You know, when Moses says, you know, cut down these people because they're causing trouble, boy, they take out the, they're ready to fight, these guys. So we see it early here. And then of course, to me the most interesting thing, neither side gave any significance or respect to the idea of circumcision. I mean, circumcision was the seal of the promise between God and, 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 and His people. The seal of the, it was the symbol that you belong to the people to whom the promise had been given. So the, the Hamorites, they accepted it simply to gain access to marriages with Israelites. You know, much like modern day you know, unbelievers, many times they come to church, you know, they're even baptized to impress the, the woman or the man you know, in the family and then psh, you, know, you never ever see them again you know, at church. I've seen that happen many times. You know, a kind of a, a religious epiphany just before the wedding and then it, which disappears immediately after the wedding. So this is pretty much the same thing here. Um, so um, uh, the Hammerites, of course, the other thing too is the, the brothers took advantage of uh, circumcision to kill them. Because we read that they both, they go into the town while the men, after they had been circumcised, obviously there's several days that they're in a weakened condition, you know, and so on and so forth. So Simeon and Levi, what they do, they go into the town, they kill everybody. They kill, they kill all the men, they take the women, the livestock, the whole thing. It was just a plot to weaken the men so that they could go in and, and destroy them. So the Hammerites, you know, uh, uh, or rather the brothers, use this uh, uh, to take advantage uh, in order to kill them. You know, in a modern day setting, it would be like uh, drowning your enemy in the baptistry. You know, you'll be able to marry my daughter if, you, if you're baptized. You know? And the guy said, okay, we'll be baptized. And once they get him into the water, you keep him under for a long, long time. You know? So this was somewhat the same thing, taking advantage of this very important, very significant uh, 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 thing, a uh, spiritual thing that God had given and used it in a very violent and, and sinful way. So of course, the Hammerites, they were punished for their blasphemy and the brothers brought on themselves great trouble because of their irreverence and their deceit. So let's pick up the story in verse 25. I don't have time to read all the passages, but I'm trying to read some of the significant ones. Uh, so uh, verse 25, it says, now it came about on the third day when they were in pain that the two uh, of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled uh, their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in uh, the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? So as I say, Simeon and Levi go in, they kill every male, destroy the town, take back their sister and also take the women as slaves and the property is their own. Jacob worries that they will now be attacked by all the surrounding pagan tribes. But it's interesting, the sons pose a question that bring out the real issue. And the real issue is, what should we have done with our sister raped and treated like a piece of property to be bought and sold and the family purity you know, threatened? What should we have done? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe not kill everybody and you know, destroy the town and take the women as slaves and so on. Maybe that was like overkill. They might have done something, but you know, that was a little, little too much. So what did they do? They acted like rash, hot-headed, zealous young men that they were. But the real question here was, where were you when this was happening? And the you being Jacob. Where, where were you, Jacob? You're the, you're the father, you're the chief, you're the patriarch. Where were you? Well, how did you let these two young guys just 
you know, hijack this whole situation to, 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 to create all of this havoc. You know, he was the head of the family. He should have taken the lead to resolve the problem. And I mean, we're looking at it in hindsight, obviously, but still, there's a good lesson there. He didn't consult God when this happened. He simply left it in the hands of his sons. So Jacob, you know, we notice about him that he had a leadership problem. Here was a guy who was easily swayed. Look back over his history. He was swayed by his mother, right? It was his mother that said, go in and you know, pretend you're Esau and get the blessing. He, that wasn't his idea, that was his mother's idea. And she swayed him into that. And then uh, uh, he was swayed by Laban. He was cheated by Laban. Look, work for her seven years. Oops, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong wife. You know, how about another seven? You know, he was easily deceived by Laban. And then by his wives, you know, each of them using him to you know, gain favor. Uh, and then they'd give him their, their slaves for him to have more children. You, know, you never heard, heard him stand up and say, wait a minute, this is not right. We shouldn't be doing this. And that's your slave, she's not my wife. You know what I'm saying? He always kind of went along with everything. And then finally, by his own sons, who kind of took over the situation and really created havoc for him. So he was a, a, an intelligent man, a man of great faith, but he was spiritually dry at this point. He wasn't providing the leadership that his family needed. And this episode dramatically highlights this more than anything else. All right, so uh, you know, in all stories, there's a high point and then there's a low point. This is the low point. Let's, let's follow Jacob and watch him as he comes back. Uh, next section in chapter 35 is, is what I call his renewal. So let's read uh, chap, uh, chapter 35 verses uh, one to four. It says, then God said to Jacob, arise, Go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. So once again, Jacob goes to God in earnest prayer and God appears to him with the instructions to go to Bethel. So Bethel is about 15, 20 miles from where he is. So it's not very, very far, but it's away from the trouble area. Um, what's interesting about Bethel is that it was the place where God had first spoken to him and he had mounted a pillar with the promise to build an altar there one day. When he was running away from Esau, it was at Bethel that he mounted the pillar and prayed to God and said, I'll build an altar here and so on and so forth, except one thing, he never followed through. He never built the altar there. The pillar was there, but the altar was not there. So perhaps the fact that he never completed the altar symbolizes his lack of resolve to follow through on his initial zeal and faith. Again, is that something new? How many of us have made spiritual promises to ourselves? I'm not going to do that anymore. And psh, you know, a day later, we're doing exactly the same thing. Right? This year, I'm going to really read my scriptures. I'm going to try to get through the Bible. You know, and you know, by the time we get to Leviticus, you know, that's it, we're done. So we all, you know, it's, it's, I, I love the Old Testament for many reasons, but one especially, it's so human. You know, the, the human nature you know, that, that is presented to us is so easily recognizable. And so um, um, uh, I would say that Jacob was having, you know, considering the age of his sons, you know, he was having the midlife blahs. You ever had the midlife blahs? Some of you are way past midlife, but anyway, <laughs> you know. If you can remember that far back, the, mid, the midlife blahs. You know, he, was, he was wealthy. He had young adults living at home. His faith was kind of soft. And this crisis was demonstrating how far he had just kind of drifted away from God. Okay? But we see the renewal in his faith as he gives instructions to his family. Finally, we see some leadership here. First of all, what does he say to them in the renewal? He says to them, Purify yourselves. 
purify their surroundings by getting the idols and the pagan influences out of their homes and out of their lives. My question is, what were those things doing there in the first place? He had been warned by God you know, not to mix with that culture, you know, to, to remain separate from them. And now he's telling them, okay, let's get rid of all the idols. So obviously he knew they were there, but didn't have the courage to put his foot down and say, okay, that's enough. Haven't we all done that? Haven't we all had that problem? Talk about, and it wasn't just in his house, he's talking to his children. Haven't we all had our children at one point watch something, do something, bring home a friend or something that's questionable, and we're like, oh dear, I don't want one more battle I can do without, and we don't say anything. We let it slide, you know? Uh, easily, he, would, he was letting things slide. But now he puts his fo foot down. Their 10 years living among the pagans had rubbed off on them as they slowly were including their idols, their customs, their habits. And the way that Levi and Simeon dealt with Hamor and Shechem was more in character of the pagans around them than the believers that they were. They certainly didn't get that information from God. God wasn't the one that said to them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into that town and kill everyone. That's not what God said. Had they sought God in prayer and asked him, what should we do? I think the Lord would have answered their, uh, their query, but they didn't do that. And so his renewal of faith begins with purifying their surroundings. Secondly, the rededication of each person in the family, almost like an altar call as they call it, or like you know, coming forward if you wish, a little bit like that. Because by washing and putting on clean garments, they were in essence saying that they recognized their impurity and they were dedicating themselves to a holy God by themselves being holy. You know, why do you think God has given us the, the uh, it is a ritual if you wish, uh, of baptism when somebody becomes a Christian? Why? Because it so signifies purification, water. You know? Someone goes in the water as a sinner, comes out as out of the water purified by the blood of Christ. There's no magic in the water, we know that. It's not, it's not like that. But certainly water you know, represents the idea of purifying. We know the thing that does purify us is the blood of Christ. But the water, the ritual of water is something that's ancient, as ancient as this. They washed, they changed. And so the change in garments signaled a change in attitude. Repentance for their sins. Thirdly, they rededicated their lives. The move to Bethel was not only a geographic move, but it was a spiritual move as well. Again, Bethel was only about 15 miles south of where they were, but it was a thousand feet higher in elevation. They were going up into the mountains, if you wish. They were moving up on a higher spiritual plane as well. Their physical move mirrored the spiritual move that they were attempting to make at this time. And then of course, the building of the altar neglected for so long, you know, he should have done it long ago. He promised God, I'm going to build an altar here, but he never did it. He never did it. And the, the burial of the idols and the pagan influences under the tree, this represents the burial of the old and the resurrection to a new life in serving God. So he says essentially to his family, let's go back to the way God has set for us and the altar at Bethel represents a new beginning for Jacob and his, uh, and his family. And so in this chapter, verses five to eight, uh, again, I won't read it here, but we see God protect the family as they travel to a place called Luz, which is uh, renamed El Bethel, uh, which, which is, uh, here, let me show it to you here. There we go, it's Luz. He changes the name to El Bethel, which means the strong God or the house of God or the strong God of the house of God. And here we would read that his nurse uh, Deborah dies, which means that his mother Rebecca had probably also died before and the nurse had come to live with, uh, with him. And then uh, in verses nine to 15, once they get there, God appears to Jacob once again to renew the promise to him. So Jacob decides to leave the place of trouble, rededicate his family, he builds the altar as a way of renewing his faith before God, and God appears to him and renews the promise that he is indeed a prince, 
Israel. In case he felt unworthy because of his failure, God reassures him that he can and he shall wear the name Israel, the prince. And also he reminds him that great nations will come from him, that he will not be destroyed by his enemies. Because let's face it, he's running away from the, you know, from the families and the, 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 the people that lived in the area, the pagan nations around him, once they find this out, that he murdered these people and his family you know, have, have done this thing, they want revenge, so he's afraid. And God promises him that he'll protect him, he won't be destroyed, and that the land, even though he moves around on it, will one day belong to his descendants. So at this point, Jacob offers sacrifice and renews his worship, renews his faith at Bethel, the house of God. That's why a lot of churches are called Bethel, you know, Bethel Baptist or Bethel Missionary. That's, that's why they call it. it's called the house of God. So let's read now. Um, and the story takes on another storyline, if you wish. We switch over to Rachel. It says, then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, uh, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, do not fear, now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. So Rachel dies giving birth to the 12th son. Okay? She calls him son of sorrow, but Jacob renames him son of my right hand. Uh, they were on their way from Bethel, that's south, to where his father Isaac lived. So she was buried in the area of Bethlehem and to this day, even if you go on a tour there, they bring you to that, you know, to that site where she's quote, supposed to be buried. That you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. You know, when you go on, on these tours in, in, in Israel, you know, there's a lot of claims that this is where this happened. And, some things are for sure, you know, where the temple is, that's for sure, they, you know, they know where it is and a lot of other things, uh, Sea of Galilee, so on and so forth, but other thing where people are buried, where Jesus was born, where exactly the, you know, the died on the cross, you know, they have a lot of buildings over these places that churches, church groups have built, but you, know, you have to, again, take some of it with a, with a, a grain of salt. Nevertheless, in Genesis we know that she is, uh, uh, she is buried there. Uh, again, go back to the human idea of it. Imagine the trauma, the moving, the pregnancy, too much for poor Rachel. Now here's a woman here who is having a child perhaps uh, later in life, difficult as that is, and especially at that time how difficult that was all the trouble that had been caused, they had to pull up roots, move, now she's pregnant, now she's having baby while they're, while they're on the run. So, so she becomes a casualty of this time in Jacob's uh, life. In the following verses we read another episode tells us of uh, Reuben, the oldest son, having sex with Bila, which is Rachel's maid, Jacob's concubine. So, uh, an individual episode, but that speaks to the condition of a lot of the individuals in the family. Of course, again, there's no mention made of any rebuke here by Jacob, but later on, he's going to deny Reuben his birthright as the oldest son because of this indiscretion. We read about that in chapter 49. So the 12 sons are named once again before Jacob finally arrives at his original home to present his family to his father Isaac before Isaac himself dies. So let's pick up the story in verse 27. It says, Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age, and his sons Esau and Jacob uh, buried him. And so Jacob, now Israel, that's his name, finally comes home to his father Isaac. The writer mentions Isaac's death in this passage, but in reality it happened later on. 
In any event, Isaac is buried by his two sons who are in fellowship with him. Both, both Jacob and Esau bury their father, it means that they've buried their animosity towards one another. He's buried in the same place as his wife Rebekah and his father Abraham and his mother Sarah, the same burial place, which is again, nothing new. We have that too as well, right? Parents are buried, kids are buried, and grandparents sometimes buried in the same place. Then the next chapter, again, we're not going to read it, but chapter 36 gives a kind of a, um, uh, uh, it gives the list of descendants of Esau, and it does it in one complete section. Uh, what's interesting is there's no description of Esau's life, his times, simply a record of his sons and daughters and the location of where they live. That's all there is, just as a, a, a matter of record. Now we know that the Edomites, we hear about them later on in the Bible, the Edomites, as they were called, were a mixture of Esau's descendants and the Canaanite people that lived around him. So as much as Jacob tried to maintain his family purity, the purity line to only marry within and not marry pagans, Esau was completely different. He himself had married pagan women and his children had married pagan women and, so, and, and vice versa. And so his descendants, the Edomites themselves, were simply a mixture of his descendants and the Canaanites. Uh, so this record is given to show the separate development of Esau's family line from Jacob, but it was Jacob who had the promise. All right, so we'll stop there. Next time we get together, we're going to talk about Joseph. Uh, the, you know, the Bible turns the page once again. We get a new character now, and we, we, we deal with Joseph, who's the last character, last story in Genesis. In the meantime, we have a few minutes left. A couple of kind of practical lessons from what we have talked about tonight. First one is, you marry who you date. I'm looking around here and aside from one young lady, I don't think that applies to too many of us here because we're already married or widows or whatever. But this is a truism, you marry who you date. It's an ancient story here, but it's a modern and consistent truth. Dinah had no other friends and sought fellowship and companionship in a pagan setting and was the object of pagan custom and practice. Now, we can't expect our Christian sons and daughters to form Christian friendships and Christian relationships if as parents and grandparents we don't promote Christian socializing uh, influences on them. Uh, what are we talking about? You know, youth camps and youth groups and church attendance and Christian colleges and schools and Christian friends in our homes and so on and so forth. You know, if we don't promote this at all, then how are we ever going to expect that our children would, would gravitate towards other, other Christians? If 90% of our children's contacts are with non-Christians, then the odds are 90% that they will end up marrying non-Christians and then raising perhaps non-Christian children. It's a hard truth, but I mean, it's just the truth. It's the way it is. One of the biggest problems with missionaries, you ever wonder, missionaries go out, they're out in the field for 10, 15 years, you know, and they plant churches, and then all of a sudden they come home. And why? Because their children you know, are starting to grow up and getting to the point where they're going to want to date or whatever, you know, have associations with others, serious relationships, and they want to get them back to a, a, a place where they can have at least a network of, of Christian uh, friends that they, can, uh, that they can associate with. Uh, so, uh, you know, simple lesson, you marry who you date. You know? So I always encourage parents, don't be afraid, even if kids say, I don't want to go to youth camp. Yeah, I don't care if you don't want to go, you're going, boom. You know? And then usually when they get there, they have so much fun, they don't want to come home. You know, they're crying, oh no, my, my best friend. You know? so, uh, number two, leadership abhors a vacuum. When leaders don't lead, somebody or something will take the lead. Uh, that's a, again, these are pretty basic things. Jacob was absent in leadership. He was asleep at the wheel and his sons took over and did what they thought was right. They had good intentions but very bad results. So if leaders in the church, for example, don't lead in a proactive way, then somebody or something else will take over. Apathy will lead, division will lead, competition, false teaching, you know, fighting, whatever. You know. 
uh, it, uh, leadership abhors a vacuum. So leaders can let the ship steer itself for only so long, but sooner or later God is going to send a wake-up call and like Jacob, it's not usually very pleasant. And I've, you know, I've been in situations where that happens. It's not fun. All right, third lesson. Renewal requires continual repentance. Yeah. Renewal requires continual repentance. Jacob's renewal required that, that he remove the idols, that he cleanse his household, that he get to work changing his home, building the altar at Bethel and beginning to worship again. And for him that was repentance, a change in what he had done. You know, we can't go forward spiritually unless we unload our sins, and here's the key, on a continual basis. When people feel spiritually dry, when the church doesn't seem to be moving ahead, when we don't feel any growth personally or corporately, we usually blame somebody else for it, but the person responsible is usually ourselves. You don't experience renewal or revival by having a meeting or organizing a project. Renewal comes when we recognize what is coming between ourselves and God and we get rid of it. Actually, uh, in spiritual development, the point of joy is when we recognize the thing that we must remove. I know that sounds counterintuitive. Like intuitively, if God points something out to us and says, you know, I need you to get rid of that, or I need you to improve that, you know, we would think the first reaction would be, oh no, man, I, I like that, you know, I like doing that, you know, blah, 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 but it, it's the opposite. Because when we're sure that God wants us to remove something or improve something, we know that if we do that, there's a reward coming. <laughs> and the reward coming is we're going to be closer to Him. And when we are close to Him, that's what generates joy and peace. That's the reward. You know? Isn't that what David the psalmist said? He said, you, Lord, you're the portion of my cup, meaning you're my reward, not things, not wealth. You, Lord, you're the reward. You are clearer in my vision. You take up more of my life. That's the reward that we're looking for, and that doesn't happen unless we get rid of stuff. So Jacob got rid of the idols, the indifference, the involvement with pagans, and our renewal comes the same way. We remove the sins, we purify ourselves, we remove the indifference, we become faithful to our ministry, our Lord, our church, whatever it is, our families. We remove the involvement with the world and sinners and we begin to draw closer to Jesus and His, uh, and His people. And it's also a good prayer to make. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a person of prayer and you pray often, I'll give you a subject to pray about. Dear God, what needs to go? <laughs> Dear Lord, just show me what needs to go and then help me get rid of it. Or dear Lord, what needs to come in? Show me what needs to come in and I will open up and let it in. And I guarantee you there's always a reward. There's always a reward. And if there's anybody that knows us and knows what we need and knows what kind of reward to give us, it's the Lord. Amen. amen. All right, so on that amen, we'll end this uh, lesson and we'll come back next time and we'll begin tackling the story of Joseph.